UBC. At, at UBC with, with Matt Chokchoy. Matt is one of the experts in the world on, on simulating uh, UFO stars. And so today he's talking to us about uh, convex systems as emitters of conventional waves and accumulating waves. Thank you. I'm really far from being an expert in uh, simulating new stars, but one of the things I'm Myself and collaborators have been working hard is trying to understand um, some systems that may be able to give both gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves. Um, so I, I, I was checking this your schedule, and it seems this week you have three speakers from PI, so you're going to have the perimeter slew or, of speakers. So hopefully we'll pick up as the, as the week goes by. So let me just uh, go on. So the outline of my talk essentially is uh, I'll be trying to think of a few systems, those are that we believe uh, should be perhaps catchable in the gravitational wave band uh, window by either LIGO, Virgo, or LISA if it ever flies, um, and then try to understand in addition to the gravitational waves uh, the possibilities of those systems uh, uh, to emit electromagnetic waves and then try to see where uh, that information can be used in conjunction to, with gravitational waves both uh, to help the detection of gravitational waves or vice versa, the, the catching the systems back uh, through the gravitational wave uh, band to help on the electromagnetic effort. Uh, so my ground rules are essentially, uh, are going to be thinking about systems which, will, which at some point will shine light. They will have at least one black hole invo involved and gravitational roles must have played a role at some point, an important role. Um, and hopefully uh, this signal might be observed. So that naturally puts me in, uh, in, in the framework of compact binary systems. I, may th I will think about binary black holes um, and then move to uh, beyond vacuum scenarios um, that either involve bi binary black holes interacting with some medium or uh, actually relaxing the binary black hole uh, um, system and going to black holes interacting with a neutron star or just two neutron stars. So for many decades, if you haven't been paying attention, um, but I'm sure you have, uh, the ultimate problem in the field of numerical relativity was the binary black hole problem. That was kind of the basic two-body problem in general relativity, a problem that you give your students uh, in classical mechanics to solve uh, in a day, um, while it took about 80 years to be solved, or 90 years to be solved in, the, uh, in, the, in GR. And it involves a series of approximation. If you want to study from very early epochs, all the way till uh, the late epochs where a single black hole is formed, you understand the system essentially, the, or we thought the system sh had to be understood essentially using three different scenarios or three different stages. The early one, we just have this inspiring system that if gravitational waves didn't exist, will just stay there forever at a constant uh, distance, slowly shrinks due to the emission of gravitational waves and the system losing through gravitational waves angular momentum. Uh, there is some intermediate stage where uh, this process happens so rapidly and the curvature, the strong curvature um, uh, induced by these binary black holes plays a major role where we didn't know what would happen. But late, at late times we know through a series of rigorous theorems that black holes will radiate away and essentially go to a quiescent state described by a curved black hole. And in between, with the, the, the idea or the, or the need was to actually uh, understand what the full theory of general relativity had to say of what the system will, uh, will produce in that very violent uh, intermediate stage. That required solving Einstein's equations in vacuum. Again, we're thinking about a binary black hole problem that has a, uh, no sources other than curvature to understand the dynamics. And this you can cast just a Ricci tensor equal to zero uh, as a series of wave uh, equations uh, where it, with a very messy right-hand side that hides in them uh, singularities, very uh, distinct scales, uh, and nonlinearities that had to be dealt with in an appropriate way in the computer to understand what the full process uh, should be. And by now we know, four years ago, 
three and a half years ago. Uh, Franz Pretorius first. Uh, the, I'm, I'm sure Carl would not like this, but they said he did it in Caltech. He actually did it in Alberta, Canada. So let me plug in, especially after Canada defeated the US yesterday, we have to uh, bring home that message. Uh, solve the binary black hole problem in between. And very quickly after, uh, everyone else was able to jump on the same ship, with, even with different formulations. And we now know that what happens in between is just the most boring, and exaggerating a little bit, uh, um, extrapolation of what you saw or what you knew you would have in the early parts to a smooth matching on what you knew uh, would be the, the description of the late part. And it's just a very simple waveform uh, in between. Uh, of course, now there is a lot of work that is going on in trying to do that, uh, obtain this full description very accurately because that's needed uh, at the data analysis front to pin down, well, first for detection, uh, but most importantly for pinning down the physical parameters of the system. But for these and, and our systems, well, actually, for our systems, or these systems interacting with some media, we certainly get a lot more than gravitational waves. Um, there are detectors out there that are catching uh, very interesting uh, signatures from some systems that are radiating a lot on the electromagnetic side. Um, and so one, um, one of the goals of the field nowadays is to try to understand which binary systems might give rise to electromagnetic counterparts uh, that might be uh, de detectable. So I I'll talk about some of those. And I'll be concentrating on black holes and effects on maybe surrounding plasma, matter, or disks or black hole neutron stars in particular in this talk, we can talk a little bit about binary neutron stars, but on Friday, Bruno Giacomasso uh, gave a talk that covered quite a bit of, uh, of this problem. So the goal of this talk will try to review some of the um, black hole uh, or binary black hole, or black hole interacting with neutron star systems and then try to understand what might be the, the emission uh, because the combination of observations in both bands may be, at, at least it, in my view, one of the most exciting things that will happen in this field um, in the future. You can argue very strongly that we have already seen black holes indirectly just by the structure of some I mean, amazing jets that we see in, in many different bands. And the first time I remember I saw one of these pictures, I, I, I thought to myself, I, I want a piece of this problem. And slowly uh, we have been working towards eventually making contact with this and uh, we might, in some areas, we might not be too far. Of course, uh, if there is another way to actually try to pin down uh, the geometry around some of these systems and uh, this, these new ideas of using VR, well, not so new, but now that it's, uh, uh, it's possible use, in using VLBI to try to uh, get the, your hands on the curvature around the curved black hole, and, but if you want to know a lot more about that, just back Avery. I, I wouldn't dream of saying any more than what I've just said, having him around. Um, or just from here, just looking at the spectacular uh, emissions that involve very high Lorentz speeds, a lot of energy being uh, thrown out in a very collimated way. In order to understand this, we know, we know that some very basic physics has to be brought in. Um, we understand it in terms of, while well, extracting some of the binding energy of the system via friction, uh, different mechanisms. We understand it either by using some uh, these penrose processes of extracting energy of a rotating black hole, or what um, people in the, astronom in the astronomy community prefer as the bland force Nyack mechanism that to me is nothing else than this process in disguise, but uh, we can argue about that forever. Uh, so it is definitely different definite prospects to hear and see black holes. We already see them in some ways. We want to now make contact with this and the gravitational waves that might be generated by these systems. Um, so I'll kind of be stranding between two different uh, uh, experiments. One is LISA. Um, so if LISA flies, and we might know later in the year uh, how likely that might be, we, and, and we catch gravitational waves from them, and that's, this should be easy. The, the signal-to-noise ratio of LISA is so good that one will see these gravitational waves very cleanly in the data stream. Uh, we will be able to pin down the masses, spins, and orbital parameters of these binary systems. We're going to get the luminosity distance to these systems. And if we know uh, reasonably well where these systems are, are uh, we are going to be able to um, pin down a much better the higher physics at 
uh, are in, is invariably kind of obscured by uh, the uncertainties in the model that we have to understand them. For instance, the model of accretion in trying to explain AGNs, um, we have to make some assumptions on some of these, um, on some of these uh, um, physical parameters where the electromagnetic observations does not completely um, get the uh, individual values for them, and therefore some assumptions have to be made which obscure the interpretation of what's co actually going on. And if you get both gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves from these kind of systems, uh, that would be, um, uh, would open up to uh, asking a lot of new questions, in particular one that has it's been re receiving a lot of attention is so pos this possibility to actually probe this uh, possibility of us living in a brain within a higher dimensional bulk because gravitational waves can propagate in the bulk while electromagnetic work waves stay on the brain and this will let us uh, actually get our hands on these possibilities. However, there is a question mark in that Lisa's localization is not that great. Um, the window, the typical window that Lisa might give is just a few degrees, square degrees in the sky and up to redshift of about two or so, we have 10 to the five galaxies. So there will have to be a lot of luck in us getting the gravitational waves pointing to an astronomer, look over there, and maybe you have one over 10 to the five uh, chances of getting um, the right galaxy. That's still much better than getting the Lotomax, but um, I'm not sure how many astronomers will be able to convince to go after that. Uh, and of course, something that people are very interested in is where there is any pre-merger signal on the electromagnetic band that might help in pinning down where the signal, the gravitational wave signal might be coming from. So in short, it's very likely that we'll see, if LISA flies, um, systems that will be giving up both gravitational, wa both gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves in a strong manner to detect them, but it's gonna be tough to know where unless we, from the theoretical point, uh, find some uh, clues on how to um, pin down better where the system uh, might be. We might not need to look too far for a detector. We might not have to hope too much for a decadal survey to be friendly to LISA. LIGO, La, LIGO Virgo, and GEO are measuring. They are, LIGO and Virgo are at design sensitivity. They are undergoing, uh, very soon, they will be undergoing a major upgrade that will make them 10 times better sensitive. Um, and their ideal sources are binary black holes, black hole neutron stars, and binary neutron stars, but they're not gonna be uh, able to see that far for binary black holes in um, reasonable estimates, reasonably hopeful estimates, they'll be able to see it to about 900 megaparsecs or so. Uh, these probably kind of have 600 and 500 or 400 for these guys. So we, um, that's how, how far these guys are gonna uh, be able to get signals from on the gravitational wave front. Uh, but some of these, these two black hole neutron stars and binary neutron stars are uh, kind of the most, um, the most likely candidates for explaining gamma ray bursts. And gamma ray bursts, we see them at incredibly far distances. They are, I mean, a gamma ray burst is the current record holder of the farthest signal that we can see. Of course, that is true if you discount CM, the CMB, which is even further, but I, I I tend to say that if you use the Big Bang to kind of boost your signal, that's, you're using per performance enhancement drugs and you should be out. So I'm gonna keep my gamma ray burst as the farthest object. So why do we care? As I said, some of these systems pro give out so much energy that we actually need all the tricks, every trick in the book to try to explain them. We need to put the nastiest objects we know of, black holes. We need to add a very healthy overdose of our physics. We need magnetic fields in extreme regimes. Uh, very weird equation of states in realms that we really don't have any uh, much of a clue simply because uh, uh, accelerators cannot probe the energy that these guys uh, have. We need to include neutrino and radiation, particle creation, etc. A bunch of things have to kind of work together to explain the energetics that we see. And of course, everything has to be collimated. Otherwise, even otherwise, even adding all these in the extreme. In extreme scenarios, um, we even have a harder time, a hard time explaining the energetics. Of course, there is another way out. Maybe we don't really know well what the basic physics should be. Maybe other systems like um, um, uh, stars that are not neutral stars, but even more exotic, like quark stars and things like uh, Rajit Huyet, that you probably have heard talks by him uh, recently. He was visiting here. 
That explains the energetic much better, but you have to buy that these objects actually exist, and that's a completely different question. So we, need, we want to get our hands on, on, on this problem on the theoretical front, uh, where some things are now on the piecemeal approach, but um, much more needs to be done. And as I said, um, hopefully the payoff will be um, really good. So let me just go after some systems and tell you what we know. Um, and so I'll, I'll divide the talk in two. Supermassive black holes binary will be first, and then we'll go into stellar mass uh, binaries in there, black hole stars in particular. So the setup will be uh, kind of having in mind, say, two galaxies that come together, the black hole somehow uh, solve the less parsec problem, if you care about that, and eventually come sufficiently close that we'll form a binary. And in doing so, they'll pretty much evacuate the region in between of them, between the two of them, they'll form a single binary black hole. There might be some gas still uh, in between them. This is something that Phil Chunk has, and collaborator has, has considered. For in our case, we're going to assume that the, there is vacuum there, and we're going to consider two possible ways in which these black holes would interact with the disk around them, and the disk might be able to, uh, indu and in doing so, might be able to induce some electromagnetic em uh, emissions. The first one will be uh, a kind of a by uh, distance, um, um, a long distance interaction by uh, doing something with magnetic fields that may be sourced by the disk. Uh, and as these field lines probe this, this strong gravity region of these binary black holes that are coming together, there is going to be an effect. Or another one, we know, we know well that once binary black holes merge, generically, the final black hole will be given a kick. And as the, this black hole moves in a particular direction, the circumbinary disk will feel the, the potential produced by this uh, massive object uh, changing in time. That, in turn, will influence the disk, and maybe some emissions will be uh, induced that way. So, of course, in order to do this, either one, realistically, a bunch of things have to be added or have to be included in your model general relativity, MHD, so as to account for the magnetic fields and the hydrodynamics uh, behavior of the disk, uh, radiation trans transport, be mindful of the equation of state use, and the disk model uh, uh, employed to describe the circumbinary disk. That's certainly a very tall order. We're going to just try to put the very minimal ingredients and then try to understand at least some of the basic things that can can happen. So I'm going to be considering two options. One, perhaps a precursor and a prompt emission uh, in the system driven by the binary black holes coming together, or an after merger emission driven by um, these black holes uh, merging and a kick being in produced. Just a single slide, let me just go fast. I just have, we have, we're employing this infrastructure that we build, have been building for the past few years. Uh, where you can do a lot of things, cool things. If you care to know more, you can ask me or you can ask Carlos. We both use it. So the first system that I'm going to think about is the following. We're imagining some, this black sphere here. This is the region where the two black holes are together. They are already, already sufficiently close that we'll, they will merge within a few orbits. Around them, there is a circumbinary disk. The distance, I mean, the disk will be um, some distance away. That's, that's not the main ingredient. The ingredient is that the disk anchor some magnetic fields that I mean, thread this inner region. And now this inner region, if you look closely, you have these two big bullets, these two black holes that are going around each other. And as they move around, they essentially steer and, and interact with the disks in a non uh, of, with the magnetic field lines in a non-trivial way. So essentially, this is my analog of your KitchenAid. Just you put the, the magnetic field and let, it, let the black holes do the steering for you. And the simple question we want to ask is what does the curvature the time varying curvature of these objects as they, mer they, they merge due to these electromagnetic fields. As the very first step, very first baby step in, in the direction of trying to understand these systems. The approach we take is therefore we use Einstein's equations coupled with electromagnetism. There is no current, so we are not accounting for plasmas yet. Um, we use a generalized harmonic formulation, and either Harald, Carlos, or Abdul can tell you a lot about that, about these formulations if you care. Uh, to know more, you can ask them. A uh, couple with Maxwell's equations, uh, where we enhance Maxwell's equations in such a way that we can guarantee on the fly, uh, dynamically, that the constraints will be satisfied. Again, this uh, uh, technicality, but if you care to know, you can ask Carlos or, or you can ask me later. 
In doing so, we actually go very much against the orthodox out there, um, but we've done it before. We're going to keep going against the, the, the typical way of dealing with this problem. Anyway, so what I'm going to show you is some very first, I mean, the, this, this simple studies where we just put some black holes in a quasi-circular orbit. We're going to strike for a simple, on the simplest case, equal mass, non-spinning black holes. We won't, don't want to strike the effects of the single spins that each uh, black hole might have, uh, obscuring the kind of new physics or new dynamics that we're after. The magnetic field is given by essentially a circular loop that is sufficiently far that it's not even in the computational domain. The, 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 the loop is outside our computational domain. And we just described the magnetic fields produced by a constant field uh, in this, say, the z direction. We assume, or we use field strength that are 10 to the 4 Gauss. This is a reasonable value. And even if you were to uh, go to fields about 10 to the 10 Gauss, the, the, the inertia provided by the fields is sufficiently low that um, this, our description doesn't really uh, care if it is 10 to the 4, 10 to the 8, or 10 to the 10. Uh, the dynamics will be the same. will be just driven by the curvature. So at early times, you can deduce or you can guess the dynamics simply from the memory in paradigm. You have a black hole that is moving in a particular direction, threading a magnetic, an essentially uniform magnetic field. That induces a charge separation uh, in, in, in such a way. So essentially, you are inducing a magnetic dipole. You have these two magnetic dipoles going around each other. The radiation that that produces is the same one that you will get in the in standard ENM with two dipoles that go around each other, except that, well, the frequency grows as the orbit shrinks. And it does so in exactly the same way as the gravitational waves do. So let me just uh, show you a couple of pl plots. This is um, the pointing. I'm going to take a cut at z equals to 0. And then the only thing we're after is, well, what kind of radiation pattern will uh, be determined by these black holes going around. So. You see these two black holes coming together. There is an initial some garbage radiation that goes out, and then you have this kind of L equal to uh, structure being induced by uh, the, the dynamics of the binary. This is electromagnetic energy density. And the important thing is we're comparing here the, the, the induced electromagnetic energy density um, in, in the dynamics as compared to what you get if you had a single black hole with the same spin that you get after the black holes merge. And you have about a 30% increase in the electromagnetic energy density just due to the fact that these field lines were compressed as these black holes came together. So that's kind of the first kind of very simple uh, thing that you get that is different uh, in the single black hole case and in the, black, the binary black hole case is this extra enhancement of the gravitational, of the energy, the electromagnetic energy density, and this sweeping in frequency of the electromagnetic radiation as the black holes come together. This is just the same, um, some plots of the electromagnetic energy density. So now this is when we get to play some games. We can say, well, the fields, if you analyze the structure of the fields, are consistent with the blind force and picture you have. E cross B uh, can give rise to some, um, to some uh, radiation. The toroidal field, the electric toroidal field that is induced uh, has a velocity that is, I mean, is proportional to the velocity of the orbit. So pretty much, I mean, the kind of basic setup is, is consistent with the bland force night picture. So let me just ask the first kind of theoretically minded uh, question, which is, well, could it be, could one have a situation where the energy that is taken out by uh, the, um, by the um, electromagnetic, in electromagnetic waves, uh, through the through a possible blind force dynamic, be such that we slow down the final black hole. The the system takes all the rotational ener energy away uh, from the binary as it merges. For that, you need to compare what is the standard, the, the time scale for a blind force dynamic pro uh, process to extract all rotational energy from the black hole, and compare it with the merger time frame, which we know. I mean, roughly it's about 50 m, where m is the mass of the black holes. If you put everything together, then you find out that if, well, if the fields are of the order of 10 to the 10 Gauss, such a thing might happen, which would be very, very interesting. Uh, and the fields are not too crazily high. I mean, they are very much higher than uh, 
we, we um, deduce from, from observations, but it's not, I mean, it's not totally crazy. But this number is not the only number you care about. The, the, the number you care about is not whether the timing is enough. The key question is where there is an ergosphere. Only if there is such an ergosphere can one extract uh, rotational energy away from the system. And it's very difficult to tell if such a, if such a um, area actually exists because one cannot, um, one cannot rigorously define such a concept, the concept of an ergosphere, if the space time is not uh, stationary. In order to do so, uh, we need to uh, do something else. And what we're, I'm going to try to do is just push a little model that we had, we came up with actually uh, in a meeting that, was, that happened here like three years ago, uh, two and a half years ago, uh, that tried to gain some insight on the binary problem through just simple modeling of, um, of essentially Newtonian gravity with a little bit of gravity thrown in. They scale pretty much the same. They go hand in hand in so this. Hand. Do a proportional model. as you decrease the binary separation, the gravitational power goes up. The electromagnetic power goes up in proportion. Yeah, like they both go like v to the four, to the fourth power. Yes. So and here, the, the only thing we're trying to do, and, and I'm bringing this up because I'm after trying to answer the, the question, can we have an ergosphere while the, or, black, the black holes are orbiting each other? It's no good if I cross the ergosphere and the black holes are plunge, plunging, because if they do so, the time scale is just too short. I want them to go around so that they can get energy out um, before they begin to plunge. And so, as I said, two years ago through a, a workshop that actually happened at CETA, we were asking the question, can one predict the final spin of the black hole? This is something that many groups did, and actually here, Nathan Boyle, Mike Keston, and Sumaya Nisanki actually came up with an, their own model, uh, which is even uh, sharper than this one. But the cool thing that this model has is that it has some physics prediction behind of it in that it tries to capture what are the basic ingredients of uh, the dynamics of the system. Here I'm going to ask the question, can we predict what is the final angular momentum of the black hole, which is just a mass times the value of the final spin, using things that we know from the individual uh, objects making up this binary. So obviously, um, if you're going to make up the final angular momentum of the final black hole, the, that will be given by the individual contribution, these individual spins that each black hole has, plus some piece provided by the orbital angular momentum. Of course, as these two objects are very far from each other, the orbital angular momentum goes to infinity. So we need to find a place where uh, we can say from here on, all that angular momentum will make up the final momentum, uh, angular momentum of the final black hole. And to do so, we chose the most natural thing one can think of, which is the angular moment, orbital angular momentum that it reduced particle of mass mu, just as in Newtonian theory, will have in a black hole that has mass m, the final mass of the black hole, and final spin given by the final spin of the black hole. So essentially, we reduce the, the two-body problem into a single-body problem for the final black hole. And you put these three things together, and we just say, OK, there is no free parameter in this equation. I have to tell what the final mass is going to be. And for simplicity, I'm going to say it's just it's, it's individual masses of each of the black holes. And the, therefore, the only unknown is this uh, spin. And then you just get what we get and compare it with the numerical results. And this is, let me just show you this table. This value, these values at the left is what you get numerically. These values at the right is what you get with the simple model. So by even within, say, 10% error in the worst case scenarios, it just tells you that this picture pretty much captures the first order uh, behavior of what's going on. And I'm going to use this. So if it is true that I can approximate the essential features of the system by this kind of a particle moving in the space I'm provided by uh, the final black hole that I can now predict with this, uh, with this simple formula, then I can also extract what it, where, where is the final ergosphere and when will that happen. So I now have, a, I can make contact with the, new, with the 
the single this, the, the point particle approximation on the final black hole spacetime and ask the question, when is the ergosphere outside the innermost zero circular orbit? In such a case, I'll have the, orbit, the black holes orbiting within the, within the ergosphere and I can have sufficient time to extract everything I want. And the answer is not very hopeful. It, it tells in that picture that it should be 0.95. And that's just, that is a very tough thing to make. Bringing black holes together um, when they have very high spin typically either just keep the spin as is or actually it lowers them. And so it's going to be very difficult to have in nature two black holes that are almost maximum speeding align coming together. Um, that will, that will, I mean, we have to understand that process better, but I think that's going to be unlikely. The typical thing we'll have is the system be more on this side where they cross the innermost circular, circular orbit and the black holes are plunging towards each other before they cross the ergosphere. That's, um, that's not uh, very, very exciting then. Um, but it points to the, perhaps this thing that I said early on in my talk, the gravitational waves in between the, the early stage and the final stage being kind of boring and being very simply just an, an extrapolation of what we know between one stage and the other one. Maybe for very, very high spins, one can have something else going on because super radiance may play a role. This, if you were reading papers in the 70s in the, in the area, there was this thing that uh, Tikolsky and Press came up with, which was the gravitational wave bomb that you had gravity waves coming out, but then being reflected back in, extracting energy from the orbiting, from the uh, rotational energy of the black hole and essentially just uh, getting uh, an, 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 a very high amount of energy out. That, um, that was one of the things people were playing around at that time tying up with super radiance. They also were wondering about where you could have floating orbits in uh, Kerr spacetime. Essentially, you have a particle that is inside the ISCO, so it should fall in, but can extract enough energy of the rotational black holes to essentially just stay there forever. That's a picture you cannot realize because it's, the process is very inefficient, but you can get some energy out. And any bits of energy that can get out of a rotation black hole can tra translate into a huge amount of power uh, on a given signal. So let me just, this, these are questions that are out there uh, we, that we're trying to analyze in, in, different, in different contexts. But let me just kind of, in the virtue of time, let me just begin to wrap this up. And if everything I've said, of course, you can put a big question mark and give me a hard time because we were doing things in vacuum. Nature doesn't like vacuum. These objects would have plasmas all around, the, uh, around them just simply because pair creation would produce them. So we're beginning to play around with the right approximation to do that, which is the force free approximation, is something that is very much um, in, a, in a green stage in that we're, having, we're not yet matured, maturing, but in some of these tests are showing in interesting behaviors. So this is just some plots for a single black hole case, and this is a work that we're doing with Carlos um, and, and the Pozo Gazzita, Travis Garrett. And on the left, side, I'm showing you the results of what happens, say, with the magnetic field. So this same, same kind of scenario, we have a, a single spinning black hole threaded with a uniform magnetic field, and then you either consider an electrovacuum scenario or a force-free scenario. For a magnetic field, you have, these are the lines you get in the force-free case, and these are the lines that you get in, in the electrovacuum scenario. Um, so essentially, you see they're very much the same, except that you bend the, cur the, the lines a little bit more uh, here because of the presence of the plasma. Now you have currents in the problem. But for the electric field, they are, they are certainly different. This is what you get in the vacuum case, and this is what you get in the, in the force-free case. And I mean, because the lines have to adapt in such a way that the electric field and the magnetic fields are, are exactly orthogonal to each other, uh, um, significant differences arise. Of course, the question is what happens when you put binaries. Let me just show you this, like the trailer of the trailer. Um, of what happens, here I'm going to put the two black holes, calculate one component of the outgoing, like the square root of the pointing flux uh, for the vacuum case. This is a cat. The black holes are going around in this, so I'm cutting in this region. Sorry for that, for that this missing piece of data uh, that got destroyed in, in a given disk. But here you saw, and the pattern is pretty much uh, symmetrical. Let me show you what you see if you now do that in the force-free case. 
uh, and now you begin to see some some hints of collimation going around just due to this this plasma playing a, a non-trivial role um, so again let me just throw this is like the the clip of Avatar three months ago you're gonna have to wait about a month or so when we get this done and you might ping Carlos to show you uh, what we get by then so I'd say that that was kind of the early part, trying to understand where there might be emissions near the merger epoch, and the, that work and the ongoing work seem to give the, the impression that there is a possibility, maybe not very strongly, of some strong emissions actually happen in conjunction or about the same time uh, as the merger. I mean, now, that was, I mean, there are still some, some things that we need to resolve. Then we go, now go to a more sure option, which is the merger takes place, and this black hole begins to move and begins to interact uh, with the digital combinatory disk that is out there. There is, um, in the past year or so, there was a huge industry, and there is still ongoing, very uh, strongly going, of people trying to understand this in many different ways, all coming out with even very strongly different uh, answers. So the, in particular, I like these two. They do exactly the same thing. They take particles. Uh, on a Newtonian potential that are far out. They follow the particle, they see pretty much the same, but they claim very different uh, conclusions. One claims that uh, as the black holes recalls and begins to influence the, the, the disk, you're gonna have a very prompt emission in the ultraviolet. Uh, Bonning et al. say you're gonna get a delay emission in soft X-rays. And the difference between this and that is just what you assume happens once you begin to heat up the, the, the gas, where the gas, that, uh, the begins to emit, that emission gets reabsorbed and reprocessed by the disk, or it comes out freely uh, right away. So we did, um, we, we worked uh, on this problem. Again, now you want to do GR plus hydrodynamics with or without magnetic field, that uh, it's also an option. This is mostly work done by Miguel Megavan, uh, a student of mine who finished uh, just last year. Let me just show you some examples. This is a case where um, we're going to study the disk and we're going to assume a few things can happen. The simplest thing that can happen and can only happen if you have an exact equal mass non-spinning black hole merger is that the final black hole mass or the final potential in the provided by the central black hole will correspond to a potential that actually, as far as the disk is concerned, sees its mass reduced by some certain amount at some given time. Because this disk, the merger is happening between, the disk sees the whole energy inside of this region, but then the black holes merge, most of the energy goes out in the last orbit or so, and all of a sudden the disk realizes it's in the wrong uh, potential and it will have to readjust itself. So this is a plot of the density uh, at a cat went through the disk, and you see that, well, once we reduce the mass of the, of the black hole by 5%, then the the disk begins to uh, reaccommodate itself to, to the right uh, orbit. In, in doing so, um, some non-trivial dynamics is induced in the disk, and that is represented in, say, the internal energy uh, by this solid line that has very strong variability, uh, and this variability time frame is very much tied to the orbital dynamics or the orbital time scale of the disk. But that would be a very rare case. It, would be a, it's, it is a rare case that you only have a mass reduction. The more uh, typical case would be one where you actually have a kick. In this R scenario, what we're going to consider is that this, the, the black hole has a kick uh, in the plus Z direction uh, due to this merger, which is not the most common kick you expect to happen. But uh, now I'll just show you this because the, the phenomenology uh, changes uh, in a strong manner. Now the black hole moves up. The disk has to reaccommodate itself, and I mean, you begin to develop inflection modes uh, in the disk. And again, this uh, impacts the dynamics of the disk. You get sh shock heating, which that in turn might, might induce some emissions. And this dashed line here corresponds to such a case where the disk, the, the black hole was kicked in the in the direction of the orbital angular momentum. But now the more generic case is that a disk will happen at some at a, an arbitrary angle between the orbital plane and the and, and 
the angular uh, momentum direction. And so we're going to study a few things. And to begin uh, kind of in the opposite direction, the first thing we're going to do is just kick in the direction of the orbital plane. And I'm going to imagine several different kick speeds, 300 kilometers per second, 1,000 kilometers per second, and even 3,000, which is kind of pushing it out there because it's really, really strong. But um, we're going to draw a conclusion out of it, which is actually very, very interesting. So let me just begin to play this. This is the case where the black hole has been kicked on the orbital plane at 300 kilometers per second. Then, again, the fluid begins to accommodate itself. Now you're going to begin to see some regions that are, have higher density and some areas that have lower density just due to the epicycles that um, the, the particles should be uh, end up in. And these, in turn, heat up different portions of the disks in different manners, which may influence also possible emissions. Uh, is the initial boundary at 6M? No, the initial boundary is at 25M. There is sufficient ambiguity in where the circumbinary disk would be, which that depending on the parameters you choose, the inner, inner boundary might be all, uh, from 6M all the way to 100 or 1,000M. So we just chose some one value that didn't have it close enough but not too far that this will take forever to, to show some, some interesting behavior. So that's what happened for the 300. Let me just show you the 3000 one. And here is the story is pretty much the same as in the R1, except that it happens at a much uh, faster time. And because the black holes also begins to move faster, uh, you're going to induce a strong accretion um, uh, stage at some, at some point in the simulation. This, uh, you already see it there uh, taking place. Again, we plot the internal energy for the different cases, and you see that, well, there is some oscillation as the AP cycles get, I mean, readjusted. Um, and then you see a very strong upswing at different times. And the upswing, the occurrence of the upswing, is strongly linked to the, the speed of the kick uh, of the black hole. But the behavior afterwards is pretty much independent. It doesn't really care about how strongly have you kicked the black hole. It cares about the orbital dynamics um, and that's what determines the time scale. And this is because that for these disks that we have chosen, the kick velocity is actually below the orbital velocity of uh, all the fluid elements in the disk considered. So what was the equation? It's just an ideal gamma law. And that's, this is a, a, good, I mean, a good question mark that you put at the end on this. As, uh, also, another thing that we don't consider here is cooling. Any, there is no cooling effects in, in any of these simulations. Let me just kind of uh, tie to this comment. This is the same for uh, the case of 3,000 kilometers per second, where the kick has, was directly off the plane on the, in, along the direction of the angular momentum, or at different angles, 30, 60, and 90, where 90 is on the orbital plane. And again, with the exception of the black line, which corresponds to the one along the orbital uh, angular momentum, all other uh, systems behave pretty much the same. There is an upswing. Uh, that happens earlier or later, depending on how much uh, of the kick is directed along the orbital plane. But from there on, everything is pretty much the same story. So you don't kick with mass change? No, no. That well, actually, we have, but not. not we, it's not published. But in the end, the most. If you go up here, so the. If you see this mass change, is 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 a very uh, kind of smooth behavior. It's a very monotonic behavior. This is the one. There is the oscillation and the very slow growth. In the out case, you have the very strong kick. And what I'm trying to say is that the picture you see is not significantly different from this one. Right. The main what we see is that the main uh, perturbing agent is breaking the symmetry. So let me just there are some caveats here. There is the disks. This these were all thick disks, which have their own instability to uh, to 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 arise there. 
Um, but the time frame that we consider, we can, we can rule out the Papalazzi Pringle instability being the cause of these of this things we see. But there is, Miguel is, has some ongoing work with uh, thin disks just to show that this is, still, is there, and as well as uh, showing some role of magnetic fields. Of course, um, and this ties to um, uh, some of the things I said earlier, the fact that the internal energy changes doesn't say anything about uh, very strongly about what the emission will be. Uh, and, but we don't really know uh, what is the right emission mechanisms for disks. Uh, people throw out different models. What we did is just try kind of three different end, end possibilities, kind of one sitting in the middle and two at the end, short of actually including radiation transport in uh, our simulations, which actually will, will make it very costly. We just consider the radiation transfer equation where you just follow photons going through the disks and seeing and keeping track of how much energy they gain or lose due to different absorption and emissivity, uh, or, uh, absorption and emissivity models. And we have three different models, one where it's just a branch and black body model, where you choose the emissivity uh, interpolating between branch alone or black body, depending on where the, th the disk is thin or thick, uh, and we just have some absor absorption given by um, uh, Kramer's opacity law. There is a thermal model and just a plain branch from vanilla. You just calculate four different photons at different frequencies what is uh, the behavior of the, their luminosity. And for different models, of course, the answers vary. But the important thing is uh, that the variation, the strong variation stays there, which is what at least astronomers would like uh, in order to try to see something. Uh, this time variability is what helps the detection. And at the end of the day, um, just comparing with observations may, may further pin down what the right emission model would be. But of course, these are just simple-minded minded models which we use to try to more or less uh, cover the different possibilities out there. And then you can take very nice uh, pictures. Of course, they, they are completely put to shame next to the pictures that Avery makes, but well, we're trying. Uh, so this is kind of the summary for that part, and then I'll quickly go through an R, the, the R part. Uh, for binary black hole and thinking about LISA, um, there is a very strong signal post-merger, which will come between days or months after the merger takes place. So LISA, again, might tell astronomers, try to look within this patch of the sky, and if we're, hope, if we're lucky, um, someone might be able to catch uh, some of these things going on. Uh, but uh, by no means this is a full story. Uh, I, as I said, we are not including here um, uh, yet radiation transport mechanisms, so cooling might play a very important role in, in, in robbing energy, quite a bit of energy out of the system. Um, and as I said, there's several groups working on, the, on this problem at, at the moment. Um, let me go back to Earth. I'm going to be thinking of black hole neutron stars. Uh, black hole neutron stars is the next most compact binary system. Uh, as opposed to binary neutron, st binary neutron stars, their merger takes place right uh, where LIGO is the most sensitive and Virgo are the most sensitive. So that's a very uh, interesting uh, um, um, aspect of this system. And it connects very strongly to the possibility of uh, models for uh, short gamma ray bursts. Of course, the, the physics is much more messy. Um, in addition to gravity, we need to include the MHDs, we know neutron stars have magnetic fields, and we have seen in the past that they might have, these magnetic fields might have a strong influence on the dynamics, and again, Bruno's talk has also touched on that on Friday. And I mean, one cool thing, but actually it's also a crux, there is more than one dissipative mechanism, and it's not only gravitational waves taking energy away from the system, but then there is uh, a bunch of instabilities related to just the MHD itself. Um, so here, if you even want to picture this split of the different stages in the system, uh, you actually have more stages. There is an early post spiral, but then when they begin to get closer, uh, there are finite size effects that play a role in the, in, with black hole neutron stars and binary neutron stars that do not play a, such a strong role in the binary black hole case, simply because tidal effects are very, very mild in the, binary, in the black hole case as opposed to the neutron star case. Then there is a the stage where the, the merger takes place, where GR plus fluid dynamics rules the day. Later on, you might be able to uh, simplify the description by just using quasi-normal modes coupled to fluid dynamics and uh, lay times, well, a fixed black hole interacting with the disk. Um, so we're actually 
trying to understand this, but from the get-go, we kind of are concentrated on these three intermediate stages um, and hopefully be able to hand in the right information to what happens at the very last one. So I'll just uh, uh, rather quickly, I'll concentrate on one particular case, which is the black hole neutron star case. Uh, many people are working on this problem as well. Harold and his collaborators are working on, on understanding what happened with when black hole and neutron stars merge, uh, and in particular, they're concentrating on the, the, the impact that the equation of state the, describing on the stars might have on the gravitational waves. We are not working on that yet, but we're considering magnetic field effects and how that ties into some very interesting phenomenology um, that I'll try to say a few things here. So let me just show you a particular example. I'm going to be considering a black hole interacting with a neutron star. The black hole will have, or not, a spin of 0.5, and uh, the mass ratio will be 5 to 1, so the black hole will be 7 solar masses, and the, black hole, the neutron star at 1.4. We're going to fix, when we have uh, spins, the spin value is equal to 0.5. This is something that most of us are converging, that a spin of 0.5 and above ends up giving rise to a, a disk that is sufficiently massive to perhaps make contact with uh, gamma ray bursts. Um, so let me just play the movie and then describe things there. So we're going to have this neutron stars that is orbiting around the black hole. The black hole is this kind of uh, solid line in here. Don't worry about that dashed line. Actually, it's, a, it's an artifact. Um, as the star begins to get closer, it begins to kind of be significantly distorted uh, tidally. Um, and then you have a very strong um, shred shredding of the star. There, what we've had is that the the Roche lobe actually happens before the innermost stable circular, circular orbit, so the, black, the star doesn't plunge in. It begins to shred apart um, before the plunge takes, takes place. Sorry for the jackiness and of, the, of the color map. There are some issues there with the data, but what you have, this is a zoom in. There is a long tail that we'll, uh, make, uh, we'll have, I'll have a picture on uh, later. Um, and the, the the velocity of the fluid never at these stages have gone past 0.5 uh, on this, on, on this uh, cut. Gravitational waves, so that was just one example. And again, as I said, you can turn on or off the, the spin of the black hole. This is what typically you'd get for the non-spinning case. Um, this is a signal that has already been processed. So the initial data starts about there. There is some garbage in the initial data that um, shows up in the waveform. We have thrown that away and replaced that by the post approximations, kind of to show the full trend. Um, so here you have the early in spirals, the, the stars come together. The star crosses the ISCO in the um, A equals zero case, which ISCO is further out now, uh, before it, it gets it to its Roche uh, radius and then begins to plunge in. Here you have the, chirp, the chirping behavior and then uh, the, the, the quasi normal ring, though it's missing in this plot. This is what you get otherwise in the unprocessed case. You still see the garbage of the initial data. We have yet uh, to tie the, post the early post phase. Um, before it crosses the ISCO, the signal gets shut off because you begin to shred the star. And actually, quite interestingly, you don't see a quasi normal mode ringing uh, signal. The reason for that is material keeps falling into the black hole, keeps exciting it, and you just have very, a very weak gravitational waves that is um, kind of here just by this mild excitation of the black hole that doesn't let it ring. Of course, eventually it will ring down, but the amplitude will be so, so small that it will be very difficult to see. Um, so in this case, the quasi normal ringing is suppressed. And that's an important a message for data analysis because in the unmodeled uh, searches, these burst searches, the typical template or the typical filter used is a sign Gaussian that assumes that kind of pre-merger and after-merger signal looks pretty much the same. And here there is a significant difference between what happens before the star gets shredded apart and afterwards. Uh, something that some of you may be interested in, in this is the uh, magnetic field. The star had a poloidal magnetic field inside the star as it uh, began. It orbits through uh, very quiescent till the star begins to be shredded. And there, uh, the, the, its magnitude begins to shoot up. We have some, uh, it goes to about 10 to the 14 for, for a time. 
And then, it, then there is a behavior that is pretty much linear. This uh, we believe is due to the winding. So you just wind the, the magnetic field, whatever magnetic field is left over, uh, being, ends up growing linearly. And early, the early part is just a combination of shear and maybe MRI, but we're not that finely resolved to capture it in, in full. But that's pretty much what we're seeing, and we're further analyzing this data at the moment. We just take um, the region between, so it's an average as long as the density is uh, one thousandth of the, the highest density. So we don't, we don't want, want to go too far in the atmosphere region where you just have very tenuous magnetic field. This is, uh, I like these plots, uh, and you probably might be able to see some of this. So this is just a picture, so this is where the excision takes place. Our black holes are square. Uh, uh, Harald can explain you why. We just use Cartesian grids. And so the black hole is outside of it, and everything that gets this square is inside the black hole, and we excise here. Wait, this. Where's the black hole? This. There. So it's outside the excision region, of course. The poloidal field, as it gets, as the star gets uh, shredded apart, I mean, it gets pulled, and then you end up uh, significantly, significantly distorting the, the, the field lines, and this is kind of what you see. Something is very, very interesting, but you cannot see it well in this picture, is that also the field lines, it's a cut you see on the side. These field lines have some interesting topology. So you have a field line that comes this way, wraps around, and it comes out again this way. So who knows? I mean, there's a tantalizing prospect, and maybe you'll have some reconnections eventually once we get to know, we know how to do that well. Uh, and maybe something will happen there. There might be some buoyancy uh, taking place. I mean, the fields have gone to 10 to the 14 to the 10 to 15 Gauss. Uh, maybe something of that is, is going on. We're, we're also analyzing that. Um, inter important one, I mean, obvious important message is that there is a significant mass left out in this particular case. About 1.5% uh, is out there. Um, and this is sufficiently massive for making contact with uh, models of GRBs. There's also a lot of matter that has been I mean, sent out with significant speed. And what we have to understand where that's, that is uh, still bound, because that might come, that, come back, and we may be able to make some contact with these um, fallback accretion models to try to explain this the very long tail after the short uh, gamma ray burst, uh, things that um, Brian Messer, Elio Quattro have been working on. Um, the something we're also keeping a close eye on is this connection between event, between what happens with the magnetic field and the, event, the eventual jet that may be formed. Uh, people like Gami, McKinney, um, Holly, etc., have, after uh, hard work, kind of settled into a configuration that is able to launch and sustain a jet for very long times. On my end of things, that configuration seemed to be too. Um, too carefully tuned, I want to know where this dynamic end up making contact with what they have now uh, settled onto this poloidal um, configuration of magnetic fields. Uh, I, w I want to see how much of that is realized. Um, and we are seeing, it's yes? Still not clear where the flux thing the jet is coming. Yes, absolutely. So there is. Very much Yep. So. Um, and we're seeing this growth of magnetic field, and there is some hints of, of course, shear, but maybe MRI growth on there. And actually, you didn't, I didn't point that in the movie. If you want, I can, I can play it again. There is a kick in the final black hole of about 100 to 200 kilometers per second. Um, so, I mean, all this is interesting, but it's one of those things that you, I mean, you try it, and, and you end up even further hooked than you thought at the beginning. What, now, we, we don't, we're not very content with that. We actually, oops, sorry. We actually would like to see if we can see the jet launching uh, or, or the hints of jet launching at, at, uh, in the dynamics. But for that, there is an unfortunate secret that I mean, we're using ideal MHD here. Where in regions where the, uh, the density is very, very low, the code eventually will fail. Whenever B squared over rho begins to be of order 10 to 100 or so, uh, it will fail. So we actually have been working on, on something else. And this is actually driven uh, most strongly by Carlos. Uh, to actually try to see how we can do one of these uh, 
systems where we accommodate for all relevant regions. And just as an example, I'm throwing in uh, an example of a binary neutron star system where, well, here you, the, the binary field or the, the dynamics here is uh, inertia dominated. The matter is playing, is, is telling what the field should be doing. But out there, um, it's not inertia dominated, it's dominated by the plasma. So we actually would like to make connection within a framework that doesn't rely on any particular approximation that everything can be treated uh, at the same footing. So typically people just match approximations in different regions. I really don't like how they do it because they are not compatible with each other. But in some particular systems, I mean, it can be done. Uh, our approach is just very unorthodox, as I said before, where we actually want to put everything together within the same framework by just using uh, GR plus Maxwell equations with a appropriate current that has some um, anisotropy and variable conductivity that will accommodate naturally to the ideal MHD in here, the plasma or the force free in here, and far out if you care, you, you would recover a uh, vacuum. Um, these are just some things, and I mean, again, you should talk to Carlos. These are actually simulations that he has been doing, where in this framework, we're just doing the very first step where we try to match just the ideal MHD here with vacuum outside. We're bypassing the plasma at the moment, but we want to make sure we recover some things we know. So that in the standard ideal MHD approximation, if you have a star with a polarity field, this is the solution you will get. Uh, in the ideal MHD and in the approach we are taking, they are essentially the same. But actually, this is the approach we're taking. This is the ideal MHD. If you multiply things by r to the cube so as to I mean, exacerbate and see clearly what is going on outside, this is what you get in the ideal MHD case. Completely wrong. I mean, you expect that if you're in vacuum and you have a dipole there, you should see a dipolar field. It's completely absent here, and it's very cleanly uh, resolved in this case. So we're extremely hopeful that things are going in the right track, um, but we need a lot more work to do. Um, so let me just kind of wrap up here. Um, I've, to zero order, black hole neutron stars and binary neutron stars, the non-vacuum counterparts to uh, the binary black hole problem in general relativity is under control in the sense that simulations are sufficiently mature that if you ask the right question um, and you are patient enough, the answer will be there. Assuming you, of course, ask no questions about what radiation transport is or what the real neutrinos are doing, because that uh, maybe my grandsons will get it correctly, though I do hope they don't, force, they don't stay in physics. Anyways, the, but I mean, the, the binary black, the, the, all these simulations are a lot more costly than the binary black hole counterpart. I mean, for a bunch of reasons that if you want, we can talk about. So the field or people in the field were mostly going at different patches on the parameter space and trying to understand the, phenomeno the basic phenomenology. The larger picture of the connection of gravitational waves with possible electromagnetic uh, counterparts and even better connection with things like GRBs. Um, we are doing some interesting pro process, um, progress there, making some contact with at least some of the things that are known, the amount of matter in the disk, the behavior of the material that is being thrown out, uh, the possible configuration of magnetic field as the dynamic takes place. Um, there are some point of contact, again, so this just talking with John and McKinney um, earlier this year, we was the, the, the question was natural rays. Well, what happens in these natural nice configurations where they see they can launch jets if you now have a kick? If you can imagine that you're going to produce one of these AGNs uh, when two black holes come together, you'd like to know how long the system will take to relax or where the jet can still be launched if you have one of these kicks actually going on. This uh, is mostly during by Jonathan, this progress, but we're uh, in, uh, in contact or, or working uh, in collaboration there. Uh, ultimately, to truly connect the real behavior, we, we have to trace all the different pieces in an accurate manner. And I argue that both GR and maybe the equation of state and to some degree magnetic fields are, are, being, uh, are being handled, but there is a lot more that needs to be done and anyway. so. The only the best thing I can say about that is, well, to be continued, we'll keep working on this, and uh, we'll tell you more as we know about. Thank you.